All right, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us today uh, for our next um, edition of our Young Leaders in Public Service. I'm DeAndre Calvert, the Community Engagement Manager for the Program in Practical Policy Engagement here at the Ford School. And today we are joined by Amy Lindholm. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Miriam McGarren who, uh, and Jordan Incovaya, who will be our, our moderator for today. And Miriam, who is our Administrative Assistant here at P3E, but also our Tech Guru that will be helping behind the scenes. Uh, please note that this event is recorded. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Amy. I've known Amy for a couple of years now, actually. We uh, met working on some fatherhood and court issues within the city of Detroit as a part of a PCLP project back in 2019, I believe. And uh, Amy was also a PCLP partner over the spring for, um, for our fellowship. So uh, we had a great opportunity to work and the students did a fantastic job uh, working on some surveys. So I thought it'd be a great addition for our students to, to hear from Amy. So with no further ado, Amy, please take it away. Thank you, DeAndre, for that great introduction. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I have to say that I was really flattered and uh, honored when DeAndre asked if I'd like to speak to a group of public policy students. Um, so I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do in my job and then um, some chronological kind of how I got here and then talk about some joys and also struggles that I experience in my position. And hopefully with that, it'll be insightful and I can sprinkle in some advice as well. And if there are any questions um, as I go, I'm okay with taking those. Otherwise, I think there's a question session at the end. So um, my formal title is Management Analyst, and I work with the Friend of the Court Bureau at the State Court Administrative Office in Michigan. And I've been in this role a little bit over four years now, and I'm going to kind of back up and really dumb it down to explain what my position is, because I know a lot of people are sort of puzzled by this job, especially with it being kind of a policy job within the courts. So I do work for the courts at the state level, um, friend of the court, for anyone who's not familiar, is the name in Michigan for our county offices that provide case management services for custody, parenting time, and child support issues. So for parents who are not living together and have children, um, kind of how they work out all of those things between themselves. So it's kind of an odd area because it's very uh, social service, social work, related, but it's actually within the courts. Um, and most people are familiar with that child support aspect of friend of the court work. So for all of these county offices all across the state, all 83 counties, they all do this work and someone has to set policies and procedures for how they do their work. And then also provide some like monitoring and oversight to see if they're actually doing the things they're supposed to do and how that's going and then provide technical assistance to them sometimes or management assistance. Um, we've had a lot of that going on post COVID um, or during, not post COVID, during COVID and as it continues because we have a lot of people leaving positions, retiring um, shifts because people have died and, and there's just a lot of turnover happening and then people have to sort of completely learn their position new. So our office um, is able to jump in and help with that. We also do, um, we develop uniform publications for use throughout the state. So for public information to understand what the office does, how it works, we provide training also to those folks across those offices. And because um, the friend of the court is actually an arm of the circuit court, um, all of those pieces end up provided by the judicial branch. So the Michigan Supreme Court created the state court administrative office to do all those things for all types of courts. And then within the state court administrative office, the friend of the court bureau does the, the work for friend of the courts. Um, so my team that I work with is pretty small. We have six analysts, so six people who are in kind of my position. There's a director, and then we have one support staff person. And most of my colleagues who are analysts are lawyers. Um, I'm, I think at this point, I'm the only one who has um, a master's in public administration. 
and my concentration in that was urban and regional policy and planning. And um, with that different focus, I tend to lead or kind of co-lead um, different stakeholder groups that might have a lot of different types of people. And we're looking at sort of how can things change kind of big picture. And that tends to be a little bit different from the types of assignments that my lawyer colleagues get. Not that none of them do that, but I tend to do more of that. Um, so how did I get here? How did I end up in this role? Um, I don't have a traditional or kind of logical path to doing the work that I do today. I went to a small liberal arts college for my undergraduate degree, Kalamazoo College, and I double majored in biology and art, um, clearly an, an obvious path to doing the work that I do now in the legal system, like quasi social work. Of course, you'd study art and biology, makes sense. Um, but at the time I wanted to be a medical illustrator and at the end of my undergraduate experience, um, I had some kind of serious health issues that threw me off course and kind of put my future plans on hold for a bit. And then in the process of recovering from that medical journey, I really developed this desire to help people when they're going through um, struggling with systems in particular, like the struggles that I was going through were with the medical system. Um, but I, I kind of broadly just wanted to help people with that because I, I acknowledged that I had a really hard time getting through that. And I was sort of completely set up for success in my life. I, I had all the privileges, um, you know, grew up consistently like middle-class, um, all the privileges from, you know, being a group with all the advantages, except for being male. Um, I'd done, you know, everything right and worked hard throughout school, went to a good school, got my degree. Um, and then I, I just really struggled to find a job. Um, part of that being, you know, the financial crash had just happened 2008. Um, but also I wasn't, I wasn't at my best because I was struggling. So that led me to kind of start thinking about different career paths. And from having customer service experience and retail jobs, I saw a posting for a customer service position with a friend of the court um, in my city. I didn't really have any idea what I was getting into initially. And um, it, it was a lot to learn. It was very different from what I expected, um, but I quickly got really invested in the work as I talked to people and heard about their struggles, um, all the difficulties that their, their families were experiencing and all the conflict between their families. And then um, that's something that really, really I connected to, to wanting to find a way to reduce that conflict rather than having friend of the court be something that seemed to be just this tool that people could use against each other um, or that without, folks wanting it to be that, that that's what was happening. Um, so at Friend of the Court, I was promoted um, pretty quickly a couple times to becoming a case manager. And in that case manager role, I found that I wanted to change a lot about how the office operated and how kind of like the system as a whole operated. Um, and I was often running into red tape because those changes were required by law, they were required by court rule, kind of things that were outside of a local office's control to change. So then I went back to school, got my master's degree in public administration, and initially um, I wanted to leave the child support field completely because by then I just felt like this, this system is too broken. Um, there's too much that needs to change. And, and I'm overwhelmed by the thought of doing that. So I ended up going into nonprofit work for a couple of years, worked for a small international development nonprofit. Um, but I found myself still running into wanting to change the, the rules and laws that sort of governed how things could happen. So, and I started looking for a policy job and um, ended up, back in child support. And the way that that happened um, brings me to a point that I wanted to emphasize for all of you, and that is having connections um, in the field that you're interested in going into, that those connections can be really, really vital. I wish that 
I wish that wasn't the case, that it didn't seem like you had to have this personal connection to be able to get a job. And I don't think it's always necessary, but it definitely helps. Um, a lot of employers are, are working to change their hiring practices, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think that having that personal connection can go a really long way, even if it's just that someone tells you there's a job opening because maybe you weren't looking, but they reached out to you and they said, hey, there's an opening I think you might be suited for, please apply. Um, so my advice is that if you think you know where you might want to be, um, get creative about how you can start making those connections. See if you know there's an opportunity for an internship um, for a research project like the, the students that, that we've been working with. Um, or just reach out to someone in an organization you're interested in to kind of ask them about what they do. And honestly, any of that kind of initiative, I think would go a long way with, with starting those connections being formed. Um, I got into the position that I'm in now because I, when I was working at Friend of the Court, there was a state level project to um, create a new child support calculator that the public could access. And I had heard about it, volunteered to be part of that team. And, and then I made lasting relationships with folks at the state and they, you know, they recognize that, oh, you, you think about the big picture, you're wanting to help people and this is, those are qualities that we're looking for in an analyst. Um, another piece of advice that I wanted to give, especially for um, women or any other groups that aren't sort of like groomed in this way that I think men, especially white men are often groomed for leadership and advancement. Um, and that is to sell yourself and, and be bold. So I'm not suggesting to like go overboard and say that you have qualities and knowledge and things that you might not have, but identify your strengths. And maybe, you know, maybe you have to work with like a mentor to really identify what those things are that set you apart from others that they see if you don't see them yourself and then know what those are and, and be able to speak about them. For me, that's something that is not, it's not like an inherent trait that I have to kind of like sell myself. And it's definitely not the way that I was socialized to be growing up. And I've experienced that sometimes that seems different between, um, I'd say like generally the women I work with and the men I work with, the, the on average, the men seem a lot more comfortable sort of saying, I'm good at this and I do that and kind of moving their way up as, as they are able to sell themselves. Um, let's see, I wanted to mention mentors having, you know, a big role in that. I was fortunate enough to have a couple mentor figures along my career path who really pointed out to me what they saw as my strengths. Um, and that, I think that can be, I don't know how much to emphasize how helpful that can be. So if you don't have a mentor like that, you know, reach out to people because that's something that I've done is just sort of like cold, cold called people who I admired in the field I wanted to get into and asked, do you do mentoring? Could you mentor me? I'm looking for someone like you to be my mentor. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. Um, some of my joys in my job today are duties that, that I've gotten to carve out that were not originally part of you know, what my team traditionally does. And, and that goes back to these kind of um, meetings with different stakeholders. And so one of those roles is acting as a liaison with corrections. So especially the Michigan Department of Corrections and friend of the court offices, because a lot of the people who we serve are a lot of the parents that, that friends of the court serve are incarcerated and a lot of incarcerated people are parents. And there's a lot of damage that really can be done to those family relationships during that period of incarceration. And, and those that can be irreversible damage. So where we have opportunities to improve that process, um, we're really trying to create better relationships and and sort of create a, a continuous system of keeping people in touch with other agencies they're connected to. So if they're incarcerated, but they have a child support case, 
getting them in touch with their friend of the court office to see is their child support still charging? It's not supposed to be if they're incarcerated, but is it? And if it is, what, what needs to happen to get that stopped? Um, and just giving people an opportunity to ask a lot of questions too. And often the opportunity to ask questions leads to folks learning newly that they even had the right to certain things like um, to pursue some sort of contact with their child while they're incarcerated. A lot of folks don't realize that that's an option and there might be for some folks, it might not be an option. Their um, parental rights could be terminated if, you know, depending on what the circumstances were surrounding their incarceration. But for many, that's not the case. Um, and there's something they can ask for. They can pursue through the courts getting custody or parenting time arrangement, or maybe they don't need the court to get involved. They might be able to just work it out with the other parent. So that has been um, some rewarding work to, to, sign, to sort of move things forward in that area. Another liaison role that I play is a fatherhood liaison, uh, again, between friend of the court offices and then fatherhood programs. And so DeAndre mentioned um, that's how he and I met. Um, Initially, we had a grant initiated um, Michigan Action Plan for Father Involvement is what that group is called at the state level. Um, and then kind of at the same time or right after that group was formed, the Metro Detroit area was forming a fatherhood policy group. So today I work with both of those groups and I really got myself into that. Um, by chasing down this uh, social science researcher at a conference in DC, I'd been like reading her research on fathers and child support and, you know, really, really was into it, wanted to like implement some of the things that she talked about in her research. And I had seen her picture on her papers. So when I saw her walking around, I was like, oh, that's her. Oh my gosh, I have to go talk to her. And through going up and talking to her, I found out that in my state, we were actually starting fatherhood work and then kind of bullied my way onto that project. <laughs> so my advice there is, again, to just um, not be shy about making connections and telling people when you are interested in, in something that you are interested and you want to be involved. And often I think it works out if you just say that. Um, let's see, I'll also say in the realm of the fatherhood work, um, there's been, I think, especially for me working in that area, a lot of relationship building that's been really important. Um, the fathers who I think most need systems change to kind of remedy the damage that has been done in their families, um, they don't look like me. I'm a white middle class my entire life, childless woman. I work for the state. I represent the very systems that are like damaging people's lives at times. And so why should people trust me? Why should they think that I support their cause? And so in this area, I think what's been helpful is to just really show up consistently, you know, always show up to the meetings. Um, some struggles that I wanted to mention that I don't think I've talked about yet. Um, the, I have talked about the red tape, but I wanted to just highlight um, I assume that all of you who are listening as public policy students, you might be considering a job um, in the government. And I, I just um, caution you or, or want you to be aware that working in government with that bureaucracy can be kind of maddening, especially if you are, you're going into it like passionate about making change and you want to see the results of that work. Um, it, it can happen, absolutely it can happen, but it takes time and sometimes just all the steps involved, all the checks and balances that are in place, the number of people who have to approve something before it can get published, um, it can just drive you a little bit crazy. So just wanted to, to put that out there that like, you know, keep in mind that that is still out there, all of that red tape. Um, but that's not to say you shouldn't pursue increasing government efficiency and you know, really keep trying to accomplish all the things that you're passionate about. Um, 
And I wanted to sort of close out what I'm talking about with a couple examples of things that I've seen um, start to change in the like four and a half years I've been in my position. Um, just in 2021, yeah, 2021, it's hard to keep track of time during COVID. Um, we published our new parenting time guideline, a Michigan parenting time guideline. So that is, um, it governs, it recommends what should happen with parenting time for everybody in the state of Michigan. So it's intended to um, be accessible and usable for parents, but also for judges, for front of the court workers, for attorneys, anybody who's working with folks on deciding what the time will look like that a child shares between two parents who don't live together. And a lot of, um, a lot of important changes happened in, in that new release. We worked with an advisory committee with folks from all different fields to put it together. It took a long time, um, but it's finally published. And there's still more that we need to do to increase accessibility and usability. And that was something that the student group um, worked on earlier this year to get a survey out to both parents who might use the guideline and then practitioners use the guideline to kind of identify those areas. But we, we have something new that addresses a lot of changes in family structure finally. Um, just yesterday, I found out that we had a grant proposal accepted to implement a plan for doing a two generation or whole family approach to friend of the court services, which basically means thinking about the child and the parent all the time at the same time as we decide how to serve that family. And that is really, that's a big shift from just being compliance driven, short term driven, you know, you have child support that's owed. Did you pay it? What can we do to make you pay it? And not thinking about like, where's that money going to come from that we're saying you need to pay right now or else. So that sort of like long term view will be a huge shift and, and I have been researching to Jen and talking people's ears off about it for like at least three years now. And finally, we, we just got this grant approved to start doing work on that. So that's really exciting. Um, and yet yeah, the fatherhood work is the other point I wanted to make that we're finally seeing friend of the court offices, some that, that might've been really opposed to considering like partnering with the fatherhood agency, being more and more interested in that and sort of understanding that they don't have a good relationship with a lot of folks that they serve and they need to be a little bit more creative and think outside the box and partner with um, folks in the community who do have better relationships to actually serve those folks better. So we're seeing that change as well. And with that, I think I'll turn it over for questions. Thank you so much, Amy. That was that was wonderful, and I think gave a lot of insight into uh, government work. And I especially appreciate it as someone considering government work. Your disclaimer on the red tape. <laughs> um, so we do want to open it up for questions. Uh, we want it to be very much a dialogue. So if anybody has a question, you can either raise your hand and ask it, or if you can write it in the chat, and I will read it out for you. Um, if no one has a question right now, I have probably a million that I could just toss out rapid fire. Um, so the first thing that, that comes to my mind is wondering about how you go about that process you mentioned of bringing these, these outside very marginalized voices into this, this structure that is very much kind of built without them in mind or built in opposition to them. Um, and especially considering the, the kinds of rooms you mentioned being in um, and the kinds of, you know, the kind of experiences that tend to be in those rooms. So I was just wondering if you could say more about, about the process of how you bring those voices in and, and that experience. Sure, I can try. Um, and I honestly, I would say it's an ongoing um, journey that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I think. In some instances, what is most helpful is to just do research. Um, 
and, and bring sources to whoever the higher ups are who need to sort of approve um, that other folks should be involved in the decision making and in sharing their experiences that play into the decision making. Um, it's, it's a shift really for I probably all large government agencies, but I think um, for the judiciary in particular, it's like a, the most conservative branch, I'd say. And um, it's, it's difficult to sort of shift this perspective that tends to be um, judges and folks like judges, you know, they have all this education and experience, they're qualified, they're the ones to make the decisions and to sort of shift that and say, well, we should also involve the people who are being impacted by this because we don't know what they're experiencing if we don't ask and hear from them. And they might have ideas about how to solve their own problems that we wouldn't have. Um, so I, I have found that me just saying that, I mean, that's, that's very much something that during my uh, master's program, you know, was sort of like pounded into all of our brains, um, but it's not common knowledge for everyone. And I'd say, especially like leadership in government who may have been in their positions for a really long time, um, it's not necessarily common knowledge. So even just to get that point across takes some, some effort, some convincing, but I think research uh, tends to be maybe the most helpful thing. Um, something that, that I did earlier this year, no, 2020, I think was the first one. We started doing these um, web-based uh, parent panel discussions where we um, worked with so I, I worked with someone I had a relationship with at like a community-based agency and asked if they could get a group of parents together who'd be willing to share what their experience was of the child support program um, with a whole bunch of child support program workers. And those conversations, um, I think, really, really paved the way for a lot of folks to sort of shift their understanding as they heard people share their story that was something they had never thought about before. Um, like there was one dad in the first panel who talked about being, having to sort of get past feeling embarrassed that he didn't have enough money to pay what somebody had decided was the amount that he had to pay every month. And there were so many people who told me like, I never thought about that, like the embarrassment of not, not having the money for what like this government agency said, hey, dad, you should pay this much. Um, so yeah, I, that, but that was sort of like this creative way that I had to think of over time for how to, you know, start getting the folks who I thought should hear from parents to actually start hearing that because I was hearing it from, going into these fatherhood groups um, and hearing from dads directly or folks who worked with dads directly all the time, um, but not everybody else was hearing that. And I think hearing directly from people makes a huge difference. So that was a long answer. Did I actually answer your question? No, you did. Yes, yes, that was great. Um, okay. Yes, if anyone else has a question, you can feel free. Otherwise I can ask a follow-up to my question. Yeah, I, um, I'll add to, I, I don't mm -hmm. think there's like one definite path for doing that. You know, I think depending mm -hmm. on your situation, it, it can be very different. So you kind of have to assess like what the needs are, what the barriers are and, and try things out and it might not work out the first time. Yeah. Oh. Okay, Miriam has a question oh, in a few minutes. Um, Sorry, that was a separate separate thing. Um, so a follow up, I suppose, to to all your great points. I'm wondering how how you navigate running up against perhaps more fundamental differences in what the goal of the agency or the governmental branch even is, because um, you mentioned that a lot of times it's a shift of perspective, and some of these shifts I I can see being very like trying to move a mountain 
type of thing? Like, is the goal of the judicial system to, like, what is that goal? And if you have a different view of someone else in the room, how you navigate that kind of fundamental difference? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I would say that I think that I was probably fortunate that the time that I entered into this role, um, the child support program, the Michigan child support program strategic plan and vision had sort of just been revamped um, to something that made a lot of sense to me and, and aligned with what I would think it should do. And then for the state court administrative office, um, similarly, strategic planning had just happened and the, the shift um, was one that, that aligned with how I felt. And so I, I guess one piece of advice is maybe, I mean, unless, unless you want to take on trying to fundamentally change that organization, um, maybe don't accept a job that, that has, that doesn't have, um, stated objectives that you agree with. I mean, small things I think are, are totally possible to move, but something that I consistently go back to when I run into sort of like opposition in, there's some something that I want to pursue, a project I want to pursue. I think we should be shifting the way we do business and I bring it to my boss or my boss's boss or whoever it is, and there's some disagreement. I bring it back to the strategic plan and I say, this directly aligns with what we say our goals are and what we say we want to do for families, for people who use the court system, like this, this will accomplish that. And so unless you're saying that's not what we believe, then I think we should do it. Did that help? Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, um, no problem. Miriam, you, you had your hand up. Yes, I actually um, I have it. a question. So um, it's really impressive. Um, just just through hearing your your journey, it was really impressive to to see how you you know moved from position to position. And I wanted to know, I guess, it seemed a few things, a few a few a uh, few thoughts that it's definitely good to have mentors. It's good to have an elevator pitch, especially when you're when you're trying to sell yourself, as you said before. Um, so one question I had was, you know. How did you go about finding the right people to talk to or even the right the most helpful mentors like how did you go about finding those people to help you yeah um great question so one one of my like first really important mentors in in my sort of new career path that i'm now on um just happened to be a supervisor who i interviewed you know i interviewed for a a position and she was the supervisor and she was someone who sort of just recognized my strengths as I would come with questions and I would say, why is this like this? Can't we do it differently? This is not efficient or, you know, this is not serving people well or the language that we use. That's, people don't know what that means. Can't we change our forms? Um, and she just happened to be someone who was on the same page with that, who recognized that I was asking really good questions, I was willing to do the work, and then would sort of reflect that back to me. Um, so that, that I would say was just luck. I don't think I sought that out. Um, but also, I, you know, I wasn't afraid to, to say what I wanted to change. And, and that worked in my favor by sort of speaking up and saying, I, I see an opportunity for change here. Um, Another sort of important mentor that I've had the last couple years, um, she is the, uh, the director of the Michigan Child Support Program, and she's a woman, she's a white woman, she, she has like qualities I would say I could relate to, and I knew she started in her position relatively young, and I was sort of struggling with being in spaces where it seems like I felt like I wasn't always respected as much as other people. Like it was, it was hard to get people to listen to me. So I was seeking out a mentor who I thought maybe had struggled with similar things before. I didn't know for sure. And I just reached out to her and, and said those things and asked, you know, if she would be willing to mentor me. And it turned out she had mentored a lot of people before 
and sort of had like such a full mentoring plate that she ended up getting a group of women together to um, have us talk to each other and then like see if we could also form other mentoring relationships to sort of share the, the mentoring burden, if you will. Actually building off, off of that, um, how do you delegate? Because you, you, know, you have a lot of tasks that you have to take care of. How do you delegate some of the things that you, that you need to take care of? Um, without feeling that you have to do it all basically. Cause I think sometimes women especially take on a lot. And so, you know, how do you delegate that well so that you can get your job done, but also feel like you've accomplished your goals basically. Yeah. So full transparency, this is definitely an area where um, I could do better. And I, and I know that, and there are, and in some of the like the fatherhood projects that I work on, I, I do take on too much. Um, that is definitely true, but I also, um, am getting more and more comfortable with just showing up to the meeting and saying, Hey, I'm chair of this, but it's too much for me. I need a co-chair who wants to step up. Someone needs to step up. I can't do it all. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's a journey for me to get better and better at, at saying those things and, and identifying where um, I need someone else to step in. I'd love to take on more interns and, and delegate more things to them. I did take, in, take on an intern for um, a task. I'm currently staffing the Michigan Task Force on Forensic Science, which is like totally outside of what I normally do, but they needed someone to support the chief justice in that work because she's the chair of that. Um, and, and they identified that I work with a lot of stakeholder groups. So maybe that would be something I'd be good at. And, um, I did end up taking on an intern for that work. And, and so I have been able to delegate a lot of things to that intern. Other questions? Oh, I've got more. I want to be careful. <laughs> Uh, I am curious about your kind of two aspects of your nonprofit work prior to or in between your government work. Yeah. Um, firstly, is how you see the difference in like organizationally between working in a nonprofit, especially a, a small one, um, with the organizational challenges that you've already identified of working with the government. Um, and I'm also curious because your the nonprofit you worked for was focused on women and girls issues. Um, and now you're working with fathers. And I was curious about the, the differences and, and similarities that you see in working with these different populations. Sure. Big questions. <laughs> really good questions, but big questions. I'm a big picture person. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. The dynamics. So, and I was at a very small um, nonprofit. We had lots of volunteers, but like very, very few paid staff people. Um, so the, the organizational structure, the power structure, the sort of like formal rules and procedures for how things happened, drastically different. I mean, so different. I, I did, you know, nearly everything at this small nonprofit where I was like mid-level management, which basically meant I was managing all the volunteers and then sort of managing our couple other paid folks. But um, I mean, I was doing marketing, I was doing fundraising, I was doing the program management. Um, I redesigned a website, I, but I didn't know how to do that. We went, I mean, everything, strategic planning. Um, it's very, very different working for a large um, government organization with so many defined like divisions that have their duties that are exactly what they do. And I think just recently this like stay in your lane um, terminology sort of like came back because I don't remember where it came from exactly, but with strategic planning, they identified these different lanes like education and whatever else. Um, so that, 
that aspect is quite different where it's very much like this is your job and only this is your job. And if there's something else that you want to do that's outside of your job, you need to sort of ask for permission and um, maybe, maybe you don't get approved to do this other thing. Um, there's a lot more, you know, being, being careful about what information you share um, and who you share it with. Um, yeah, lot, lots of differences there. I don't know if I touched on specifically the things you were wondering. Did I? Yeah, okay. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah, and then um, differences and similarities working with um, women and girls in an organization that, that is attempting to serve women and girls versus working with fathers and organizations that serve fathers. Um, Honestly, there are a lot of similarities because unfortunately, or I, I, I don't know if it's necessarily universally agreed upon as unfortunately, but a lot of the ways that in um, developing countries, the organization I was working for was trying to empower women in education, um, financial empowerment and healthcare, those are some of the same things that a lot of fathers here are struggling with in some of the same ways we're trying to empower fathers. And really it's, for me, it's, it's all about making families as a whole stronger, um, setting kids up for success in their development to have like this healthy environment to grow up in. And then um, overall community health and strength in the long term. So even though you know one was fathers and one was mothers, um, a lot of similarities. Thank you. That's very insightful. Are there any other questions floating around the audience? I, I just have one. Um, you know, it, as students are thinking about going into uh, into working for the government, and you know, you've talked about uh, red tape a couple times. What are some of your kind of personal slash professional coping mechanisms to deal with that red tape. I, you know, I've worked for city government and I work for the state and I just know, especially at the state level, the process can be slow. So how do you kind of woosah and, 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 and keep, uh, keep encouraged while you're waiting for uh, some of those things to pass? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Sometimes I wish somebody else would give me the answer to that. Um, I mean, being able to vent to folks who can relate to it, I think is, is always helpful, um, not to go overboard with it, but just being able to talk to like a colleague who can relate and, and not feel like you're the only one who's frustrated by it. Um, but also I would say, again, having like relationships and, and connections that you can use to at least sort of check on where something is and kind of see like, okay, is there any way around this? Is there something extra that I can do that would help you speed up this process? Um, that tends to be my go-to, like, I don't like waiting. I just wanna make it happen. So what can I do to make it happen? How can I, can we change the process? Because the process is crazy. Um, and, and occasionally that happens, like we, we have all these court forms um, that have a very defined process for like if, if a legal form that, you know, someone is required to use when they file a certain type of motion in the state, um, if that is going to be changed, it has to go through this very formalized process. And at some point early on in the pandemic, we had a form that had an address that needed to be changed. And it was going to have to go through this like crazy long process where this committee has to meet, they have to consider the change, they have to approve it. And the committee wasn't scheduled to meet for like the entire year. And yet this was just a mailing address on this form that said, you know, mail this form to this address. And we knew it had changed, like that government agency did not reside at that address anymore. And we actually, we'd managed to get that process changed and to say for the types of changes that are simply just 
change of information that, that is agreed upon, we can go a different path. We don't have to have the committee meet to say, yes, we vote, we agree, blah, blah, blah. So not so much a coping mechanism, but uh, I, I just want to try to change it, which can still be frustrating. And then I need to vent to people. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as a, a follow up to, to the point you just made, I'm curious about, I imagine there's different strategies for when the change that needs to be made or that you want to see is coming from legislation that you're required to follow. Uh, so I was wondering about your and your department's like relationships with legislators at the legislative branch and how you navigate uh, those relationships. Another very large and broad question. Um, yeah, so this one has a little bit more specific answer um, because like the judiciary really isn't supposed to be making legislative change. So if there are areas where, you know, there's something that someone within the judiciary needs to, wants to advocate for, um, we do have a legislative liaison. And so it sort of goes to that person and they have their relationships within the legislature to, to see about getting things changed. And it's usually you know, a relatively minor change, like the language that's in an existing law um, no longer jives with language somewhere else. And, and so that needs to be adjusted. Um, but that is typically how that happens. And then some quite often we get pulled in to sort of analyze um, proposed legislation to just kind of look out for where there might be issues um, with existing court process. And so that usually would be something that is being proposed by maybe a legislator on their own, or it might be something sort of coming out of the executive branch. And then we get pulled in to sort of do our analysis and just see if there are any red flags. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think if there are no more questions, DeAndre, would you like to bring yeah. us home? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Jordan, uh, for moderating it, Amy. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank Amy. I want to thank you again for uh, for your thoughts and your feedback and and your encouragement. Uh, I know that the space is. Uh, it sounds like it hasn't always been easy, but it's something that, you know, I've been able to witness firsthand uh, your perseverance and all the change that you've been able to make. So I definitely appreciate that as a father, too. Uh, I appreciate that there's someone that's advocating and, and being an ally in this space. I think it's so important. Uh, at this time, I'd like for everyone to unmute and their audio and video and join me in thanking Amy for her time today. A few round of applause. Uh, and I want to thank you all for attending and and everyone's great questions. Uh, please look out for the next uh, Young Leaders event that will be on uh, November 9th with Michael Randall. Uh, he's the Senior Director of Community Impact at the American Heart Association and another community partner of the PCLP. And then on November 16th with Andrea LaFontaine, who is the Executive Director for Michigan Trails and Greenways Alliance. Uh, thank you all for your time today, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks again for having me.